So this video continues by having a look at equilibrium calculations based upon basic understanding of equilibrium from the last video. In this case, what I want to do is suggest that whether we look at this from the perspective of just equilibrium calculations or look forward and enhance this by looking at acid-base calculations, I want to uh, recommend a pattern that's probably going to be pretty helpful for solving all of these problems. It's going to start pretty much in all of chemistry needing a balanced chemical equation. Once you do that, even if it's just done in the back of your head, figure out what the equilibrium expression looks like, which is going to be the next topic covered. Leave yourself room for an ice table, which will be described in a little bit. And then from there, you should have enough information to actually mathematically solve the problem. So an expression or an equilibrium law expression is based upon this notion that we've decided as a ratio, it's reasonable for us to consider how much reactant has been turned into a product by considering the ratio that we see there, concentration of product over concentration of reactant. The Kc value then is a way of putting a number to that so we have an idea of, uh, generally speaking, whether we have a reactant or a product favored system. However, that is just mentioned in general terms, and you'll notice that an actual chemical equation like the one shown up at the top is um, gonna have to be translated somehow into the equilibrium law expression. So the question is, how do we go about doing that? Well, let's first consider that we have a generic equation like the one at the top, where A moles of chemical big A react with B moles of chemical big B. That's in equilibrium with C moles of C and D moles of D. So essentially C and D are the products and A and B are the reactants. The small letters A, B, C, and D being the ratio of substances that have to go through a complete reaction are considered as exponents in the equilibrium expression. So you'll notice that the way that we resolve products over reactants with actual chemicals is that we list the concentration of the first product to the power of its coefficient in the balanced equation. Go on to the next product, use the coefficient again. On the denominator, then we go on to using the concentration of the first reactant to the power of its coefficient, and then the concentration of the next reactant uh, to its power. So given that reaction that we had on the previous slide, if we have a look at that, you'll notice that the products are listed in the numerator, the concentration of carbon monoxide to the power of one, times the concentration of hydrogen to the power of three. This would be divided by the concentration of methane to the power of one times the concentration of water vapor to the power of one. Now, the ones in this case don't have to be included. I've just left them there to be kind of overt about what's going on, but you'll see in future examples that those exponents will be left out because they don't actually impact the numerical value at the end. One thing to note is that we don't always include everything in what we write down for an equilibrium law expression. The bottom shows that really if something from the time that we start the reaction to the time that we reach equilibrium, if there's anything whose concentration really doesn't change, in chemistry we say that its activity is one, so it will not be included in the equilibrium law expression. In short, what these are, are any solids whose concentrations really don't change, and any liquid solvent. So most often this is water, when you know that everything else is behaving in an aqueous system. So in the first example, you'll notice that we have a system where water vapor is reacting with carbon, producing hydrogen, gas, and carbon monoxide. And we only include the gaseous components in there, and we exclude the carbon being a solid. In the second example, we have an aqueous system, but water being a product. And so you'll notice that water is omitted from the numerator and we include everything else. 
If for some odd reason you actually don't have any reactant or any product that are included because they all consist of substances that, that need to be omitted, just leave yourself a number one there as a placeholder just for ease. So now to put this together into a group of steps, let's have a look at this. Now I've left out uh, this information in the idea of a question um, just for ease, so it's easier to consider and look at, but consider that if this were written as a question, you would have to extract this information from the question in order to figure it out. Now, I do also want to admit that using an ice table in this particular question may not seem like a needed step, and I would agree with that. However, I think it's more valuable to establish a pattern and solve information using that pattern as opposed to relying on um, sort of guessing and checking or being um, kind of thoughtless about how you're handling a problem. So by always taking your equilibrium uh, equation, which often is given, but sometimes you have to construct it, then using the expression that we see over on the right, which is something that you would make as a result of the equation, you can populate the information into an ICE table. Now ICE stands for initial change and equilibrium. And you happen to notice that in this case, all the information that is provided is actually related to the equilibrium condition. So the first two rows, again, may seem unnecessary, but we're going to leave them in just as a placeholder. As a result, uh, these values that we see here can be inserted into the appropriate places in our table. So the concentration here, and it ran out of space at the top, but technically these would be in moles per liter. Okay, the next one would be 3.5. Okay, and then lastly we have 5.0 times 10 to the minus 2. And it looks like that. So, what we would do in this case is we would um, require all of the information that we substitute into our equilibrium uh, law expression to be the values of the system at equilibrium. And since those are all given to us, this is actually a really easy question. All we have to do at this point is to substitute all the information into our uh, law. And then this just has to be input into a calculator and a value calculated. So in this case, we get 7.9 times 10 to the fourth. Now, the sig dig rules here are pretty easy. So we just look at the values that go into the multiplication and we should produce the same number of sig digs on the way out. And I do want to note that um, as stressed in the question up at the top that we're looking for the value of Kc, that uh, all that we have to do is calculate a numerical value and not worry about the units. There are in fact units at the end of this calculation, which don't have to be considered for this course. Therefore, I'm not going to worry about it and we can just move on. In a different type of scenario, want you to notice that we can switch things up a little bit and consider the following. Um, I've on purpose chosen the same equilibrium uh, equation, and so I could keep the expression over on the side, but notice now that my values are changed, and I've got some initial values and some equilibrium values. So let me input what we have to start with. 7.9 
Now, often, the way that these questions are phrased, we aren't given a quantity of product initially. And it's very common, in fact, correct, to assume that the way that we've started the reaction is that you only combine together a bunch of reactant into an otherwise empty vessel, meaning that correctly there would be no product present initially. So that's an important assumption that we can make. Now, I want you to notice that one of our columns looks like it has a little bit of information that we can fill in here. So I want us to consider that aspect of things. In this case, what must have happened in order for the product to start at zero moles per liter and end up at 0.12 moles per liter is that we must have gained 0.12 moles for every liter of vessel that we had. Now, for that to have happened, we must have used up a bunch of reactant in order to do that. Now what's interesting and maybe a little bit counterintuitive is that the change row, so how much reactant we must have lost, is going to have to obey or respect the mole ratio. So I want you to notice that there is a two to one to two ratio between the reactants and the products. And we have to replicate that two to one to two ratio in our change row. So because the product right now you'll notice is in a column with a coefficient of two at the front. I think it should be pretty easy to see that the value that we're gonna write down over here for the SO2 is gonna have the same numerical value because those coefficients are the same. However, what must have occurred is that we must have lost that quantity of SO2 because of course we use up those reactants in order to make the product. Now. The next column for the O2, you'll notice, has a different coefficient. It's half of the coefficient of the SO3, and so it's also going to have half of the concentration, and it will also be lost. At this point, what you can do is you can think of working through each column additively. In the one that we already established, 0 plus positive 0.12 gives us 0.12 moles per liter at equilibrium. So now if we look at the SO2 column, we have 0.15 moles per liter to start with, plus the loss of 0.12 moles per liter uh, due to the reaction. So what's gonna be left over at the end is 0.03 moles per liter. Okay, we do the same thing in the uh, middle column. And we get that value as a result. These now, all being concentrations at equilibrium, can be substituted into the uh, law expression and solved for a value of Kc. So it becomes pretty straightforward at this point. So we take the concentration of SO3 squared Divide that by the concentration of SO2. Square that. And then the concentration of O2. And when we put that together, again, now this work actually provides us with a bit of a kink. We only can write this to one sig dig at the end. And so I think the best we can represent this as is one times 10 squared as the value there, okay? So that's what would happen in this system. You might be saying, well, how can you have two values that are so different between the two uh, systems? That largely would have to do with conditions like temperature, which we'll talk about in a different video. So that's uh, not important for this particular case. We're considering these to be independent systems. One last thing that we can do is kind of work this backwards in order to, let's say, be given a value of Kc, but then have to figure out a value of a concentration at equilibrium. 
So now we can use unknowns and things like that in order to figure it out. So let's have a look and see how this would work. So once again, the information that we're given involves this information for the reactants. And rightly so, we can assume that we have no product initially. Okay, so we seem to be in a bit of a, a pickle here. Might be hard to kind of figure out what to do next, but the question gives us some guidance. It says that we want to find the concentration of carbon monoxide at equilibrium. So let's make that a value of X. Let's make that our unknown. So in order to have gone from zero to X moles per liter, then we must have gained X moles per liter in that column. Now in this case, the ratio is nice and easy. It's a one to one ratio all the way through. So that means that we must have lost X moles per liter of carbon dioxide, lost X moles per liter of hydrogen, and then we must have gained X moles per liter of water vapor. If we resolve each of those columns, we will get the following values. At this point, what we can do is substitute all the information into our expression. Okay, now for ease of notation, I do want to point out that x times x really can be represented as x squared, and 0.15 minus x times 0.51 minus x can be represented as that term squared. So I'm just going to simplify that here before we move on. So there might be other ways of doing this, but the simplest way of solving this problem is to realize that at this point, we can actually take the square root of each of these terms. I know I don't need a bracket down there, but it'll make it easier for the next step. Okay, so at this point, Let's cross multiply and get this going on. So then we would use the distributive property to take the constant outside, the square root of 0 0.106, distribute it into the uh, bracket, and then take the variable terms, so all of the x's, and move them to one side. At which point, uh, what would happen is you would solve for x, and because that represents a concentration, then we could actually add correct units there as well. So that would be the concentration of carbon monoxide uh, in this system at equilibrium. You could also assume that that's going to be the same as the water vapor. And then you can actually use that number and go back and use that as a subtraction in order to solve for the concentration of carbon dioxide or hydrogen gas by going 0.15 minus that value and getting a result. So that gives you an idea of some pretty basic variants of equilibrium constant calculations, and I hope you found that helpful.